If you grew up in the 90s or early 2000s, you probably remember these beige boxes. Back then, this was considered cutting-edge tech and the internet was just going mainstream. Like many of you, I've spent countless of hours on these machines growing up and I've been reminiscing a lot recently about those simpler times. So I decided to make this working miniature computer for my desk to bring a piece of that nostalgia into my workspace. Let's dive in. I started by gathering few images for inspiration and reference to help me replicate some of the interesting details later in the design. I will be going for a compact horizontal desktop form factor with the screen on top, making the miniature one attached piece. For the brains, I'll be using Raspberry Pi 4 because that's what I have on hand, and like in this previous project, I prefer to make a multifunctional prop. So this Pi will also run some of my home automation stuff. Taking into account the horizontal desktop form factor and the Pi's orientation, we need an appropriate screen to match and determine the rest of the dimensions. What I'm looking for is a screen with a squarish aspect ratio around 3 inches wide and a decent pixel density to make the miniature aspect work. Most of the options I found were either too wide, too tall, or had a low resolution. And when I found a decent option, the interface was DPI, which occupies most of the GPIOs and that won't work for this project. So I settled on this square 720x720 4-inch display by Waveshare. I'll mask a bit from the top and bottom to make it look closer to the real thing. I'll expand more on this later. Looking at the references again, there are a few details that I definitely want to replicate. One is the boxy light indicators that were very common in electronics from that era. They usually used light pipes to spread lights from an LED source giving that iconic glow. To my surprise, I found a lot of options on DigiKey for light pipes in all sorts of configurations and sizes. I ended up choosing these rectangular ones that look exactly like what you would find in devices from that time. I'll be using this array of two, one as a power indicator and the other for disk activity on the front of the desktop. Speaking of the front panel, I'll also be adding a power button in a micro SD card extension where the CD or floppy drive would be. This seemed like too good of an opportunity to pass on and this is something that I didn't think of in my previous project. The card stayed buried inside the case and every time I wanted to swap it I had to open the entire enclosure which got annoying very fast. To implement these features, I plan to design a custom PCB add-on for the Pi that incorporates all these elements and distribute power where needed. With the plan more or less figured out, let's hop into Fusion and get started on the design. First, I define the main desktop box that will host the Pi to figure out the best shape for the add-on PCB. Since this will connect to the Pi via the 40-pin GPIO header, I had to account for the height of this connector. After a few adjustments, I had the components more or less in the right positions, I then proceeded to wire it up, including a USB-C connector in the back and two headers to power the screen and this cooler I'll be adding as well. For the micro SD card in the front, I'm using a push-in push-out connector wired to this flat ribbon cable. This bridges the PCB to a tiny adapter in the micro SD card slot on the Pi. Although I know nothing about signal integrity and this is just a two-layer board, I did my best at least to lent match the data traces and stitch the ground planes to mitigate any potential issues. If this fails, I can still use the connector on the Pi directly. After placing few fasteners and adding details to fit everything in the desktop box, I turned my attention to the screen. As I mentioned before, I masked a bit from the top and bottom to get closer to the 4x3 aspect ratio and try to balance the bezel for a uniform spacing. The screen assembly is mainly supported by this bracket that connects to the base through this joint. To allow the screen to swivel slightly, I added grooves and corresponding stops. The Waveshare screen I'm using includes a small audio amp to output HDMI audio via this connector, so I added slots to hold two of these speakers that I used before. I'll get back to wiring them later in the video. Next, I imported the screen model into the other design to create the hole for the cables and add fasteners to secure it to the desktop box. I also added some aesthetic details and a tiny cover for the micro SD card. I'm hoping that the push out force will effectively eject this piece, allowing for easy access later. Some of these features are extremely tiny, and I'm not sure I can replicate them, but I guess we'll find out soon. With that, we're pretty much done with the design and we can now send the board and the little adapter to PCB way for manufacturing. 
In the meantime, we can start printing the enclosure, made possible by Hay Gears. I'll be using their Ultracraft Reflex system to bring this project to life. As someone new to resin printing, I found their one-stop production platform incredibly easy to use. It makes prototyping straightforward and consistent, allowing me to focus on design and finishing projects rather than fiddling with the settings. Once the models are loaded into the blueprint slicer, you can either manually adjust the orientation or use the one-click processing feature. This feature automatically handles repairing, orienting, supporting and slicing the models, which is a huge time saver. I usually start with the auto features and then tweak things manually to ensure support marks are minimal on the visible parts. For this project I'll be using the PAU10 resin, which is recommended for end-use products. However, if I needed to validate new ideas or run few iterations first, I would go for the brand new rapid prototyping resin. It's specially engineered by Hagers to have moderate viscosity, making it suitable for fast printing and curing while retaining excellent details. The reflex system's ease of use and high success rate mean even a beginner like me can achieve injection mold-like quality without a steep learning curve. Just like we send the prints over the network, we can also send the wash and cure jobs to their respective stations. The blueprint slicer calculates all the optimal settings in advance, ensuring the best results with minimum intervention. After removing the supports and curing this first batch, I repeated the same process for all the remaining pieces. The parts turned out fantastic, making me consider using resin a lot more for future projects. This isn't my first time with the Reflex either, I used it for my Mondrian Macropad project and was equally impressed with the quality and consistency. If you're looking for a reliable advanced resin system, I recommend you check out the Ultracraft Reflex. Plus, Hagias are running a special promotion right now, until August 10th you can get a $200 discount in two resin bottles if you use code SALIM or the link in the description down below. Thank you Hagias for supporting the channel, now let's prepare these parts for painting. Even though the print quality was great, we still need to address some support marks and ensure the surfaces are as smooth as possible and ready for painting. I started by using an X-Acto knife and tweezers to carefully remove any protrusions from the supports. Next I moved to wet sanding with various grits to even them out. To tackle any remaining imperfections, I gently used these 1000 grit foam strips that easily conform to details on the entire model. Before we start painting, we need to apply primer to ensure the paint adheres properly and the surface has a uniform texture. Airbrushing might seem a bit intimidating at first, but I think it's the best tool for this type of work. While I can use a regular brush, I don't think I can get a uniform finish on flat surfaces like these.
To get closer to the off-white color in our references, I mixed these two colors from golden with some white and thinner. Once I was happy with the test color, I prepared the larger batch and coated all the visible pieces in two to three layers. It might be very hard to see on camera, and it looks like a lot of work to go from the original present color to this off-white, but I think it makes the entire difference in selling the miniature look. After the paint fully dried, I did a test fit and realized that I messed up this piece. The bottom shell is way thinner than it should be, causing the front panel to not stay completely straight when assembled. But I think I can salvage this because the resin has some flex to it which is great and these two holes will secure it to the add-on PCB pulling it back where it should be. Once everything is put together it should stay in place. For the very tiny details I used a black wash that I made from this shade in grey. The wash settles in the recesses and crevices creating shadows and this makes the details more pronounced and gives the miniature a more realistic look. Now that the detailing is done, we can put aside the enclosure and move on to the electronics. The few remaining parts I ordered for this project arrived just in time along with the PCBs. I intentionally kept all the SMD parts on one side to make it easier to solder them using a hot plate. There are a few bridges that will need to be cleaned up, but in my opinion this is still much faster than soldering everything by hand. Next I move on to the through hole components soldering the USB-C connector, the two headers for power, and the 40-way GPIO connector. Now it's time to test the board and review a few functions. But before we do that, a quick word from this segment sponsor, FlexiSpot. They sent me their E7 Plus desk which you've seen me use throughout this build. By now you've probably heard about the ergonomic benefits of standing desks. What's even better is a height adjustable workbench. Changing the height to the perfect level while building stuff allowed me to work standing or sitting comfortably for hours. Assembling it was straightforward, although the frame is heavy, so you might need help moving it once it's put together. I chose this beautiful top with the dual motor for leg design. It's incredibly sturdy, rated to lift 440 pounds and has rock solid stability even under load. Check out the FlexiSpot E7 to upgrade your desk or workbench. They offer several beautiful finishes and accessories on their website with sales and promotions throughout the year. Link down below. Thank you FlexiSpot for your support, now back to the project. After soldering the board, it was time to test it out and see if that microSD card extension worked. First I confirmed there were no shorts using a multimeter and then powered it on. It seems to be running ok, I ran several read and write tests and it passed with no issues, so it looks like it's working. This brings me to the next few features we added. The LED and the power button, I simply added few lines to the config file utilizing existing overlays as I mentioned before. The LEDs are working as expected and the power button turns the Pi on and off without any custom script. Now for hooking up the screen. This particular one is designed to be mounted directly to the Pi and connect with these pogo pins. I opted to solder the power wires directly to the pins and isolate them with some heat shrink. This is not ideal but there is no stress or tension so it should hold fine. For the audio I needed to figure out the pinout for the GST connector to wire up the speakers. I couldn't find any information about this in the wiki or with the package, so a quick look at the amps datasheet and some probing helped me determine what goes where.
As for the software that will be running on the miniature, that's going to be Twister OS by Pylabs. It's a general purpose OS with several Windows themes that perfectly capture the feel and aesthetic of those retro environments. After running the install, copying my custom settings to the config file and tweaking the experience a bit, it's time to finally put it all together. I secured the speakers with some hot glue in the designated slots and plugged them into the screen to test it out. As a finishing touch, I made these water slide decals to add a little more detail to the front panel. And with that, it's complete, and here are the final shots. Check out the size of this thing, it looks ridiculous and adorable and I'm really happy with how it turned out. It brings me back so much memories. It's been sitting on my desk for a couple of days and I thought I'll show you how I interact with it and go over some of the mistakes I made while building it. To control it, I have few options. I can either connect peripherals via USB or Bluetooth or remote into it using VNC or SSH depending on what I need to do. Again, Pylabs did an amazing job with these themes. Some of it really feels exactly like the real thing. I explored some of the emulation stuff that comes with it to revisit some of the old classics and I also connected a wireless controller for the occasional RetroPie sessions. Now for a few things that I could have done better. Aside from what I mentioned for the bottom case being too thin, the little cover for the micro SD card slot didn't work like I wanted. It's not as smooth as I'd like and the position for the card is a little bit hard to reach. It works but it's fiddly. I should have considered a cutout in that PCB and to center it in that opening, even if it meant moving other components. Speaking of the components, I've used some very small ones without having any major space constraints. I tried to make these projects as easy as possible to replicate and that should have been a higher priority in my list. Newcomers in this hobby are still intimidated by soldering and half millimeter pitch components don't look exactly inviting, especially for a silly project like this one. When working on the small aesthetic details, it felt weird and time consuming to do all that stuff in sketch drawings in Fusion. I'm sure there is a better way to handle that. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Lastly, tolerances and accuracy. I didn't prototype some of the pieces that interface together properly and that created sloppy joints like this one. I thought it was easy enough and not worth the hassle, but I should have made sure that the tolerances are better. Regardless of all these shortcomings, I'm still very happy with the result. As usual, everything I mentioned and project files are linked in the description down below. Thanks again to FlexiSpot and HeyGears for making this video possible. And most importantly, thank you for watching. I will see you on the next one.